Hello. <clears throat> yeah, I'm uh, rather soft-spoken. I don't have a nice booming voice, so as you can see, I rely on microphones. A um, little bit about me. I am have been keeping bees totally treatment-free for 13 years. I started back in 2003. I got my bees from Conan Queen Company, which I've, I hear a few of you have got some packages from there. Um, I'm, as it says, based in Medford, Oregon. Uh, about 10 years ago, I moved from Medford to Arkansas, where I lived for eight or nine years. And that's where I've done the bulk of my beekeeping. I just moved back this year, this last year, this last October. This is my first beekeeping year back in Medford. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of accustomed to a different sort of environment. As you can imagine, Arkansas is uh, much warmer, much more humid. Um, but I'm an Oregon boy. I love Oregon. I do not hate California as some Oregons do, or Oregonians do. Uh, I love it down here. I've spent a lot of time down here. Um, this is a this presentation is a project of mine that I've been working on for a few years. The genesis of it came from I think it was 2013. Um, when I met up with Sam Comfort, you may be familiar with Sam Comfort and Anarchy Apiaries in New York. And um, we kind of brainstormed this one afternoon while we were waiting for him to do a presentation, much like this one. Um, my focus is on beginning beekeepers. Uh, I've been in treatment free beekeeping since the beginning. And it is my goal to get everybody there. I'm not going to do that by arguing with you. Um, so when you see this, and I know there's probably more than a few of you in this group who treat your bees, and that's, that's fine, that's your thing. I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just trying to demonstrate how I know that this can be done because I do it and I've done it. And ultimately I believe that um, keeping bees treatment free is the best way that we can move forward with beekeeping. Um, the best way that the species will be able to survive in the long run. So that's kind of how I do this whole thing. And this is the first time that I've given this presentation. I've, I've written on it extensively. So please do, if you don't, if, if, if my voice isn't coming through, if you don't understand something I say, I tend to speak quickly. Please raise your hand. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, I've kind of made this my life work, and this is kind of on the upswing of, of my career as a professional beekeeper. So uh, I do thank you for the opportunity to come here and workshop these ideas and help you and you help me in the ways that we can both um, help each other. So just getting getting started off um, how many of you are beginner beekeepers like either don't have your bees yet or just got them this year or something like that okay that's maybe 10 20 percent how many of you have been doing it a, a few years two three four five years very good and then how many have been doing it for a long time. All right, great. Um, there was another question I was gonna ask, but I forgot. Oh, also, this video will be on YouTube in case you wanna go back and watch it. I have a, I have a channel called Treatment Free Beekeeping, so you can go and check that out. I video my presentations and I video other people's presentations so that everybody will um, in case you're not writing notes, I notice many of you are writing notes. That's awesome. I'm educated as an engineer. If it weren't for notes, like I wouldn't have gotten through life. So, so expansion model beekeeping um, is what I call it. And basically the idea behind it 
is that we're going to keep bees like we want a lot more than we actually want. Now, I, I did the took the liberty of checking into your um, Eureka beekeeping regulation, and it says that you can keep up to four hives on one property is uh, up to ten thousand square feet, which is a quarter of an acre, and then you can keep an additional four additional one hive per extra twenty five hundred feet of property area. So, if you've got up to half an acre or bigger, you can keep eight hives. And I'll address that a little bit later. And I understand that um, you're gonna want, uh, when, I, when I present this idea, a lot of people are concerned that they're gonna have too many hives. And I understand that. But the thing you have to realize is it's really easy to get rid of hives. You can give them away, you can sell them, you can combine them with the hives you already have. It's really easy to go from too many to fewer. It's a lot more difficult to go from very few, especially zero, up to four, eight, or however many you'd like to keep. So keep that in mind. So back to the treatment free beekeeping concept. What I want to work with is instead of spending a lot of time um, learning how to keep learning how to do the treatments and spending a lot of sleepless nights and and nervous unproductive time worrying about whether or not your bees are going to die um, instead of doing that hit it from the front right you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get ahead of the problem if you're expecting to lose one of my one of my bosses early in my work career said um, if you expect to get a flat tire then leave half an hour early you're preparing for what's going to happen what you oftentimes know is going to happen or know could happen if you leave half an hour early to go somewhere and you don't have a flat tire then you're just early but if you don't leave half an hour early and you do have a flat tire then you're late it's especially for important events, this is just an analogy, especially for an important event, it's much nicer to be early than to be late. The same thing with beekeeping, it's much nicer to have extra hives than to have none or too few to do what you wanna do. And the other thing is that <clears throat> treatment-free beekeeping is especially reliant on the genetics of the bees because we're relying on the bees natural abilities um, you've, you've heard of, of SMH or SMR or other traits that you'll find um, people sell Russian bees that are supposed to do better with mites and a lot of those things are true but Ultimately, you need to have those things last to the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that. And so by developing the genes that we have here, we can get bees that not only have those good traits for taking care of mites and other diseases, um, it's been found that hygienic bees are good at just about everything, including keeping foul brood out, um, nosema and other diseases. So, not only just having those traits to keep the diseases down, you also here have a fairly, I'm not gonna say unique environment, but you know, I was talking to um, Jamie a little earlier about your climate here. And where I am in Southern Oregon, I have temperatures from, say, 20 degrees to 110 degrees. And those temperatures happen at different times of the year. And here, you guys apparently have a much milder climate. You, apparently, um, temperatures usually in the 60s and um, highs usually don't get much above 80 but you also don't have a very cold environment either so you need bees that are adapted to this area and if you're buying your bees from somewhere else 
like say the Central Valley or um, even Old Saw Apiaries, which is a good source. I mean, it's, I'm not denigrating that source, but I'm saying it's better to develop what you have here so that the bees are adapted for here and they can do all the good stuff they do here rather than bringing in bees from the outside. Now, I am... Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned it's better to uh, develop your bees. <coughs> now, I happen to agree with you. But do you have any tips about doing that? Yes, and I'll, I'll get into some of those as we okay. go along. I am down on packages, but I don't want you to feel bad about buying packages. I know everybody's bought packages. I bought packages when I started out. What I want to say is that there's a better option and that if we all work together, especially um, and, and develop all of our all of our practices as a community, we can avoid bringing those bees from outside. And some of this is some of this is a little bit developed for beekeepers in other parts of the country, because this is going to be on YouTube and stuff. So I, you know, want to talk to everybody. You guys here have um, local sources of bees. You can you can order packages from no further away than somewhere else in California. A lot of people in the country have to, especially in the, the northern, northeastern areas, have to order bees from um, the south, either from, from California or from Texas or Alabama or Florida or wherever. And they get bees that are grown and adapted for some place like Texas, which is super warm, and they get shipped up to some place like Wisconsin, which has a winter that you can't even imagine. Well, some, some of you may be from there, I don't know. But even in Arkansas, you know, we got temperatures in the minus 10 range. I lived in Denver for a year and a half and the temperatures are down to minus 20. Um, but here we have sort of the, the other end, whereas your bees, we were talking about ventilation earlier, uh, your bees would typically be heating the hive year round. Whereas bees from another area need to be adapted to be able to cool the hive for a substantial part of the year. So that's, that's one aspect. So again, I want to say that I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings who's, who have bought packages. Um, I just want to implore you to try to do better next time. Okay? Uh, another thing we need to focus on is uh, swarms, and I heard about your, your swarm list, and that's awesome. Uh, swarms are one of the best places to get bees, and I, if, you've, if any of you listen, anybody listen to the podcast, my podcast, Treatment Free Beekeeping? Anybody? A couple? Awesome. I just did an episode with, uh, with a friend of mine in Indiana who does swarm trapping, so you can learn all about how to trap swarms and instead of investing in a bunch of package bees you can build a few nukes or buy a few nukes and catch your own bees and they're basically free and they're local bees because hives that swarm are healthy you need to understand that hives don't swarm unless they're healthy and happy and doing a good job so when they swarm you're getting good bees and you can get good bees for free the other thing is uh, splits. We heard about somebody got some splits in the back. That's awesome. Um, it's a good way to support your fellow beekeepers. If you sell a split, you can make a few bucks, you can pay for another hive, you can help your friend out, you keep everything local, it's all good. And then um, there's a few more methods I'll discuss here in a little bit. Now, I know this is, this is kind of hyperbolic, all right, I want to be a, beekeeper, a commercial beekeeper in five years. You really only need to think about that way for like one year, the first year. So you can start with 
you start with a few nukes or start with a split from somebody else or start with it's diff more difficult to start with a package because you're probably going to have to wait till the next year before you start really expanding um, like I said extra bees are easier to get rid of than they are to create uh, and the other the other good thing with with having extra bees is you may hear your friends say sometimes I have three hives but one of them's not doing really well or I have two hives but one of them's not doing really well or I have five hives and two of them aren't doing really well when you have extra bees to play around with you can take that one or two hives or however many hives it is and replace the queen with a daughter from another hive that you have that's a lot better and it's really hard to do that when you've got when you've got just two hives and this one's doing well and that one's not doing well so what do we do because there's a chance that whatever we try and do could go wrong and when you have five or more hives if one thing goes wrong with one it's a lot less of a big deal than if you have one or two and you do something and something goes wrong so here's a here's a concept i was thinking about lately when you have one hive you basically have one chance for things to go right or wrong right you add a hive to that you now have two chances for things to go right or wrong you have, or you can I'm not really an optimist or a pessimist but if you wanted to be an optimist about it you have two chances for things to go right there's another side to that but let's not talk about that two chances for things to go right but if you think about it you actually have more than two chances because if say hive one goes queenless you now can give hive one a frame of brood so that they can make a new queen so it's more than one chance because hive one is still winning hive two is now grafted off of hive one's chance or, sorry I had that backwards so instead of having two chances for things to go right now maybe you have two and a half chances for things to go right so tools um, to kind of get this done there is it makes it easier if you have the right tools to do any job right so let's start with nukes a lot of you uh, have have most likely started working with nukes either they can be five frame deeps or you could use I've used as big as ten frame deeps or five frame mediums or eight frame mediums and what these are is essentially for anybody that doesn't know it's a small hive it's got a queen it's got brood it's ready to go right now these boxes the ones that I've built you can see this one on the right here is it has a disc entrance I find those are super useful you can get those from Kelly bees and what those allow you to do is have a single round entrance which is easy to defend and you have different options as to what you want that entrance to do so if for some reason you don't want the queen to escape or don't want that hive to swarm you can turn it 90 degrees to the right and you now have a queen excluder on the entrance if you need to move the hive somewhere as as with nukes you'll undoubtedly be doing if you use this to catch a swarm somewhere you can turn it 180 degrees and now you have a screened entrance so you don't have to worry about bees flying around while you're moving them and you can obviously close it completely don't really use that option very much and then open of course these are I love these because your average nuke setup that you could buy from Man Lake or one of the other manufacturers is going to set you back thirty to fifty dollars. Depending on the quality of plywood and the price of plywood that you use, you can make these for as little. What's a what's a four by eight piece of half inch plywood around here cost? Thirty eight. All right, then you could make these for less than ten dollars each or you could use used plywood you get for free you can make them for free you could use cheap reject plywood for maybe ten dollars a sheet you can make them for 250 each so they're they're really 
cheap to make. They're really durable. You can find designs, um, the, the dimensions for them online in a lot of places, including my website. They're just really useful for many, many different things. Now, the one that I really like to use is a queen castle. Anybody familiar with queen castles? A couple? Awesome. What a queen castle is, is a, is a normal sized box. They're typically sold in a 10 frame configuration. And inside of this box, we have dividers. Now I built this one, this is a medium. This is three three frame nukes. And it's a standard 10 frame box dimension. And what I've done on the ends is to cut a quarter inch slot in two places on each end and then use a piece of five millimeter plywood as a divider. So it makes three three frame nukes with plenty of space on either side so you don't have to worry about smashing bees. And what you need to understand about what these do is that this hive, or if you, if you put three hives in here, three nukes, they will share heat, right? So there's a there's an optimum size for a hive. And especially here in a cooler environment, you're gonna be concerned about um, keeping the bees keeping themselves warm at different times. Now, probably not gonna be a huge problem here because your, your low temperatures are pretty mild. But um, especially when we're working with very small hives, it's important that they're able to generate enough heat on their own to take care of themselves and this helps with that. The other thing to think about is that small hives, and this, this includes the five frame nuke we saw earlier, small hives want to be bigger. Not in the same sense that we want things, but they have a, their bees have this genetic programming of how they do things. And so they want to get up to a certain size so they can swarm and reproduce like all animals want to do. And so when you have a small hive like this, they can grow in ways that a big hive just never seems to be able to do. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, a little bit more about the design here. You can find this on my website if you want to build a few of your own. As I said, slots for the plywood, five millimeter plywood, quarter inch slots, Otherwise, they're just the same basic dimensions of a hive. This one happens to be a medium. The only difference between a medium and a deep is three more inches. Um, the other thing that I add to them, which you can't see in this picture here, <coughs> is <coughs> there's a hole, um, inch and a quarter, I think, hole back here that is um, screened on the inside. So what that does is the entrance is right here. It's a about three eighths inch by half inch entrance. It's only big enough for about two bees to get through there. And the importance of this is because we're dealing with such a small hive, we have to worry about steal or robbing. If you have a, a big entrance and a small hive, you're gonna get a big hive comes after the small hive and robs them out. And that'll be the end of that. So because robbers are driven by scent they'll go for the biggest hole in the hive so in this case the big hole is on the back but it's screened over and the robbers will go for that and they'll never see this small hive so they'll never be able to get in i've never had one of these robbed out so i've come up with some funny little titles for these you can feel free to throw vegetables if you want um, so this, this method is a method I came up with a couple years ago, and it presupposes that you're starting with some nukes. They don't have to be nukes. They can be other hives. They can be, um, they can be larger hives that you've had for a year. Maybe they've been split up the first time in the spring, or they don't need to be split up. You can do this with several other hives. But one of the, the benefits with those nucleus hives is that you can take one frame out of each nuke, if you have five of them, and 
put them in another box and put a new frame of foundation or a foundationless frame in there or comb if you have that available. And you can do that every week or a week and a half or two weeks depending on your season. So just assuming that we do it every week, at the end of the first week we have now six nukes. At the end of the second week we have seven. At the end of the third week we have eight and that goes up until you get to about the fifth week in. Now that first nuke that you made on week one, their queen is ready to, to lay and you can now take a frame out of that one. And now you're, every week you can make more nukes until the point you're making two nukes a week and then you're making three nukes a week. And so you have this huge number of nukes. And the benefit of that is not all of those hives are going to make it. Some of them, the queen is going to go out on her mating flight and she's going to get eaten by a dragonfly. And so you'll have a queenless nuke. You take that queenless nuke, unite it with a nuke that has a queen, and now you have a 10 frame hive. And you can, like I said before, you can take the ones that aren't doing quite as well. It's always easier to go from more to fewer. You can take the ones that aren't doing quite as well. You can pinch the queen or however you decide to get rid of her. You stack those together and now you have a bigger hive. And now you have more hives. So over the course of a year, you can go from, start with five nukes and you can go to I don't even know how many hives. There's a, I did work out the math one time, but you can go to um, 10 or 20 full-size hives at the end of the year. Um, the other thing you can do with those, with those queen castles is instead of using five, uh, five frames in a five frame nuke box, you can take three frames and put three, if you've got enough hives to do three three frame nukes, you can do three nukes at once. Now the downside I discovered, one of, the, one of the formative moments for my beekeeping philosophy is that one year I did a bunch of walkaway splits. That's where you take a bunch of frames from one hive and you put it in another hive and you let them raise their own queen. So I went out after maybe two weeks. So after the, the queens had emerged, they'd had time to be you know, raised up and be capped and emerged. And I went and picked up all these dead queens, these dead virgin queens off of the ground in front of all these hives that I had made. And I had a collection of like a dozen from like four hives. And I thought that was just such a waste because it takes almost a month for a, for a hive to create a new queen from scratch. And if they're spending all that time and all those resources making 12 or 15 queens and then the, the first one hatches out and kills off the other 11 or 14, then that's a huge waste. So what we can do with that <coughs> is have one hive instead make those queens. So we have one, you know, if we had um, start out with those same five frame nukes, instead of taking one frame from each of them and making a queenless nuke, now we're going to make one of them queenless. And you can do that by, you could take the queen, you don't need to kill the queen for no reason, don't do that. But you could take the queen out of that hive and maybe put another frame of brood to make it up from another hive. So it's queenless. And so they're gonna raise their own queens and they're gonna raise 12 or 15 queens. And then at the end of the 10, you want to wait about 10 days before you, you pull the hive apart and you're going to have 12 or 15 queen cells and you can cut those out and put them between two frames of brood and put them in a queen castle. Or you can, if you have the stuff, you can do them in five frame nukes or again, however you want to do it. So what that's going to allow you to do is instead of wasting the resources to make 12 or 15 queens and then most of them get killed, all but one of them get killed, you're going to make that same number of queens in one hive and then you're going to split it up between a bunch of them, other hives providing the brood for those nukes and now you've got 12 or 15 nukes and you've only made one hive queenless. 
and no queens had to die just because they weren't the first one out of the cell. Yes. Okay, uh, so normally I wait till the queen cell's cat before I try to move it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't had very much luck successfully moving them. Uh, the only way I can do it is take the whole frame and move it. Uh, Any time I try to cut it out, I seem to have problems. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to get uh, one queen per frame and or to take multiple queens out of the same frame and get them in a new frame? There's a couple of different ways you can... His question was, um, he's had difficulties with moving those queens, cutting them out of the, the comb and moving them to other hives. Maybe they don't, they don't hatch out or something happens and that just doesn't work. Uh, well, they seem to be delicate. And I seem to be ham-handed. That's a possibility also. All right, so uh, the problem is, is you pick them up, you move them, you put them in a new hive, and then you die. Now, maybe I'm not doing it right. I probably am not. Now, There's any suggestions you have on improving my technique? Yes, there's a couple of things you can do. One of the first ones that I think not a lot of people know about is that queens are kind of fragile from, uh, it's about right after capping, right after they've been capped up until about 10 days after, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of, I always think on, on um, in terms of when the, the queen was grafted or when the, when the egg was laid. So when the egg is laid, it's about three days until the egg hatches, or maybe four, depending on the weather. And then um, that's when you would want the, the optimum larvae to become a queen, because she'll be treated that way from the beginning. And then it's about 10, on the 10th day is when you would typically go into a hive and move the, um, move the, the queen cells. They are fragile from about, say, the, the sixth day to the tenth day. So if you move them around, um, you've got a little uh, pupating grub in that cell and jiggled around can injure them. If you wait too much longer beyond the ten days, then they start to want to hatch out before you're ready. And then they kill all the rest of them and then that's no good either. So that's number one. Just make sure you, you get them on the right day, either right at the beginning, right right before they're capped, or right toward the end before they're going to hatch, before they're going to emerge. The other thing, um, especially in a cooler environment, is making sure that they stay warm enough. Um, if you pull a frame out and let it sit out for any length of time, it's going to get cool, and you the brood can die that way. I don't know what the, the actual solution is, because I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but those, those are a couple ideas. Okay, uh, another suggestion. I've seen some articles where they have little uh, spikes that you put into the staff that, that basically prevent the queens from going around and killing each other. Mm -hmm. Do those work and are they worth the money? Um, <clears throat> those I've seen a couple of variations. A lot of times they call them um, hair rollers, like curling rollers because they kind of look like that and they go over the queen cell to keep the queen from escaping and those work just fine basically what it does is allows the queen to emerge and hatch out and be fed by the the worker bees but not be able to escape and kill the other queens nor can her coming out cause the workers to go and kill the other queens which also sometimes happens so yes those do work there's also ones that you can stick over queen cells that um, allow the queen to hatch out but not be attacked from the side. Because if you look at a, a queen cell that's been chewed open by another queen, it'll be chewed open through the side, not through the top. Whereas the queen would emerge from the top. So there's also a cage that can go around there that allows the queen to come outside but not be attacked. So I've used those and they're also 
nifty because they have a little fork that you can stick them into the comb. Um, but those wouldn't be for, for wild queen cells. Those would be for grafted queen cells. You can also do... Um, the other concern is that you can't have a free queen around in the hive. So if there's one of those hair rollers on one queen cell, then they have to be on all of them. Because if there's one queen, queens will fight through screen and kill each other through through a screen. That can happen. Thank you. True. All right, so we've made queens with one hive. There's another fun one that I call the nail biter. And this is where you just wait for a swarm. So instead of causing this to happen, you're just going to go in your hive every five days or so and look for swarm cells. And when that happens, you take, you can either cut out the, the individual cells and make new nucleus hives with each one of those, or you can just take one frame and however many cells on, it has on it and start a new hive with that and give it, you know, another frame of, of brood without queen cells on it and a frame of stores or something else. And those queens will hatch out and you'll have, instead of, you'll have a bit fewer, but those queens may be better taken care of because they're coming from a swarming hive rather than from a queenless hive. So that's important. But that one, and this one you can do anytime you find queen cells, anytime you find swarm cells. I recommend never killing never destroying swarm cells. Um, in my view, it would be better for the hive to swarm. And, I, and I, have a, I have a broader view. I'm not thinking so much of my hives. Again, that comes from the perspective of having too many hives all the time. So you can afford to lose a swarm once in a while. You can afford to, to let that go and, and it takes a load off your mind because you don't have to worry about losing something. Yes? Do you use lure hives? I do. I do use um, swarm catching hives with lures in them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, instead of, and I've heard this many times, is to try and stop swarming so that we don't have wild bees around. Look, there are already wild bees around. Don't let anybody tell you that all the swarms are gone, that all the wild hives are gone, because they're not. And you can hear stories about uh, a hive and a tree. They're still around. I don't know why people say that they're not around, because just because you haven't seen something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There are a lot of wild hives around. Um, yeah. Now here's how I do my method. This is a bit more complex. Like I said, I built all my five frame nukes and I built my queen castles. You can buy five frame nukes and you can buy queen castles. Um, five frame nukes you can buy from just about any beekeeping supplier. It's just half of the dimensions of a 10 frame box. Um, queen castles you can buy, the only place that I know of that you can buy them from is Brushy Mountain. Um, they have deep ones that are four two-frame nukes, or they have medium ones that are three three-frame nukes. I prefer three frames in all cases because otherwise they like to swarm on me before I'm ready to move them. I had that happen a couple years ago. One of my, two of my nukes, I, it just happened to be that the timing was uh, that I was working and I didn't have time to move the hives and move the nukes into bigger nukes And so I lost one swarmed totally went away I, I like it happened in the morning like they just flew off and I followed them for a while and they were just gone and then <clears throat> Another one I had Swarm out of the hive and land on my bush in the front in the backyard And I took a I took a nuke over there and I tried to catch him catch a swarm and you know dumped them in and they flew back out and they went back on the tree and so I dumped them in again and they flew back out again they didn't want to go so I 
I dug through the swarm with my finger and I found the queen and I stuck her in a queen cage and I put the queen cage in the nuke and then I dumped them in again and that time they stayed. So I don't want to have to deal with that. So I, I like the nukes to be bigger because it gives them an opportunity to lay for a certain amount of time before I have to worry about moving them and they can, they can grow. Um, that's why I don't like the two frame ones. So um, a lot of the methods we've talked about tonight are queenless. Right? You want the way you make queens generally, and this is the way that your commercial beekeeper where you buy your queens and nukes from makes their queens, is they make a hive queenless. And by that, they cause the bees to make new queens. The method that I use is by keeping the hive queen right. And the reason why I do this is because if you only have one hive, or you only have a couple of hives, and you don't want to take the time to make one of the hives queenless or you don't have the equipment to put that extra queen in or you don't want to deal with a queenless hive which a lot of times is a lot meaner than usual and sometimes will abscond. If you make a hive queenless sometimes all the bees will just go somewhere else and they'll go to a different hive. <coughs> so I use a queen right hive and the way that I do that look at this next picture here is start with a a normal queen normal hive uh, I don't use queen excluders so that's not correct there on the left um, but I make these dummy frames and these are like these are like division boards only instead of being a board it's a box right so it's the dimensions the one you show here these ones each are the dimensions of three frames right three, four, three, that's 10 frames. Mine I make two and a half, so that in my center section, I have five frames rather than four. It's just my personal preference. So what this allows us to do, now there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a method to the madness here, in case you're concerned. What this allows us to do is to channel the traffic in the hive up through that area. Right, you want to keep that warm and keep it well fed because those queen cells that we're going to put in there need to be warm and well fed to be properly developed or we'll get queens that are scrawny and don't lay very well and will probably be replaced very shortly. And the queen excluder is required because if the queens um, essentially as the queen travels around the hive she leaves a trail of pheromone that tells the bees that she's okay and she doesn't need to be replaced. Remember bees are, as animals go, fairly uncomplex. Most of what they do and understand is all genetically programmed. They don't have an expansive memory like we do. They have a very short lifespan. They have a limited ability to be trained. They can be trained. They have very um, excellent capacities to store locations and um, travel information and coordinates and things like that. But as far as remembering events, they just can't do it. Um, so that queen pheromone, as it gets dragged around the hive, tells all the bees that she's okay. We don't want that on our queen cells or else the bees won't make queens. So what we're doing here is we're kind of creating an artificial area in the hive where that queen pheromone doesn't exist. So the bees in that area are thinking maybe we're, we're okay with, maybe we're going to replace this queen, right? They're not actually, we're not, we're going to keep them from doing that but we want them to think that's what they need to do because they're basically just working on, when a bee comes on to a task, they're kind of just doing what the bee before them did, right? So if, if a bee's wandering through the hive and there's a queen cell there and it's got a, a little larvae in there, they go into the mode of we're making queen cells. The same thing, the reason why foundation works. When a, when a bee comes across foundation, there's shape of a comb. We must be building comb. 
or in a foundationless, you know, they start from the top. And so they go to the top and they see this little piece of comb hanging down that somebody else started and they say, we're building comb. And so they add their part. They do their part. It's, it's, it's kind of hard for us as humans to understand because we have the mental capacity to follow the process through from conception to completion. And it's kind of hard for us to understand how there's an organism where from conception to completion involves thousands of individuals, none of them knowing the beginning from the end. They're just doing their part, okay? So what we're doing is we're creating a spot in the hive where the queen pheromone isn't, and then we're gonna place queen cells into queen cups. And here's the part where people go, I don't wanna graft. I don't want to get in there with a little tool and scoop larvae out that are a tenth the size of a grain of rice and put them in. I don't want to do that, but it's really, it's not that bad. And in fact, if you can find somebody who is doing this or just buy the tool yourself and go out there and scoop things up and just see this is not that big a deal because it gives you an opportunity to create a bunch more hives with minimal amount of waste. I'm not saying you have to do this. That's why I presented the other methods before. I'm just saying this is the way that I've discovered is the most efficient. And that's what I'm all about. Question. Yeah. So you said you don't use queen excluders. How do you keep queen excluders in your hat? I don't use queen excluders normally on this side. The queen excluder has to be on that side or it won't work. Yes. And is the is this a full of ten frame on the bottom of this queen? Yes. The queen box? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's full of frames. Yeah. So they think that there isn't they think they need to make more queens because her scent doesn't go up? Right. So what's she leaves a footprint, kind of a footprint scent as she as she walks around the hive. And it's not, we don't know exactly for sure, but it is thought that when there's a part of the hive that she doesn't get to, that the bees think that she's, her production is starting to decrease, so she may need to be replaced. Which is also one of the reasons why um, package bees often replace their queen within a month or two of, of when they're installed, because they're starting in an empty hive in a condition where they know they haven't swarmed they're just in an empty hive and there are parts of the hive where the queen doesn't go and so they kind of think that maybe she needs to be replaced it's we don't know exactly but that's the theory okay so basically we're going to prepare the queen right cell well just a second let me yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful document. Uh, pictures are marvelous. But uh, there's a couple of things that were confusing to me. One is you have these big blocks, uh, which you call dummies. Now, what actually are the dummies and what are their purpose? The dummies are, um, they're just a box. They're a box with the same dimensions of the frame, only they're wider. So what I'm doing is I'm taking up that space on the outer edge of the hive to make sure all the traffic of the hive goes through the middle where the queen cell is. So you can make, you can make those out of a solid block of wood, in which case they'll be heavy. I've made mine out of scrap plywood. They're just hollow. Uh, another question. Uh, would this work if you just put uh, two brood frames in there and let the bees choose which which ones to uh, put uh, queens in? They will n probably not make queens that way. Okay, thank Be you. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, because they're they're not starting with a queen cell to begin with. We're so you actually have to start with a queen cell. Yeah. Good, thank you. So what I've done is I'm I'm grafting larvae into queen cells and put that cell bar frame in the middle of there and they raise queens with it. And I put brood frames up on either side of it 
so that we make sure that we have lots of nurse bees in the area. Okay, uh, one thing, I, another thing I'd ask is most people that do the, the cell bars, they do multiple queens. Uh, but what number of queens do you put on a cell bar? I typically do 24. Thank you. You can do less. You can always do less. It typically get accepted anywhere from 12 to 20. So it's a, it's a good way to make a small number of queens, not like this isn't how they do it commercially to make, they usually make 50 or more queens in one go at a time. And then once those queens are ready, where are my next? Okay. Once those queens are ready, um, I'm going to take the queen cells out. I've got to keep very good track of the dates because if they, if one of them hatches, it's going to kill the rest of them and the whole thing, and you just get one queen, and it's going to kill the original queen too, so that's no good. So they're going to, we're going to take those queen cells out. I'm going to put one frame of brood, one frame of um, stores, and one either empty frame or foundationless or foundation in that three frame nuke that I have, and then that becomes my mating nuke. The queen emerges, she goes out, does her mating flights, comes back, begins laying. When it gets full enough so that I see that there's a lot of brood being laid, then I will add, I will move that three frame. So I take, so if I have the box sitting here, there's going to be three, three, three. I'm going to take six frames of foundation or comb or whatever. I'm going to make three five frame nukes out of it. If one of them, the queen doesn't come back from her mating flight or she doesn't start laying or something, for some reason she fails, now I have one five frame nuke, take one extra frame over here, another frame some somewhere, somewhere else, I have two five frame nukes. Okay, so I, I, I graduate them from three frames to five frames, and then as they grow, graduate them from five frames to ten frames, and that is the way that I make nukes. And I, it seems complex, but just the basic steps are we make a queen, we put her in a mating nuke, we make the nuke bigger until it becomes a hive. And we can do this all using the same size frames as what we normally use and without any really specialized queen castles or sorry, mating nukes. Now, here is what I want to impress on you guys for the future of beekeeping. Because um, we all know at least somewhat in how the beekeeping world works today. Every year we've got hundreds of thousands of hives which go to po almond pollination and if you think about it hives aren't meant to move like that right throughout the country throughout the world we have hives at a certain density in nature and if this hive catches some sort of disease there's a lower chance that it'll spread it to the nearby hives which may be miles away Maybe it won't spread at all. If that hive dies without spreading it, that disease dies with that hive. If that hive spreads it without dying, then that hive has survived and adapted in some way and that disease becomes part of the population without destroying the population, right? That's most of the diseases we have now. If that hive spreads it, and then dies, it's only spread to a certain number of hives around it. And there's a chance for those hives to adapt before they spread or die before they spread. And so if you think about it, the disease doesn't spread very quickly across the area, the continent, the world. And so that's how beekeeping has existed for the past however old you think the earth is. What we have now in the past 
100, 150 years. There, there is some evidence that there was migratory beekeeping further back, but when you're piling up skeps on a wagon, it, you don't move your hives very far. It's just not very fun. But now we take hundreds of thousands of hives from all over the country and we concentrate them in this one spot in California. And then we take them all back everywhere else. You've now taken that one event where one hive catches a disease and maybe could die from it. And you've now spread that same disease to hundreds of thousands of hives and they go back and spread it to the other millions of hives that are in the country. That is not workable. And we've seen in the past 10 years especially, uh, or even, even a little bit further, if you go back to the early 90s with the introduction of Varroa, which, which had we not had, which could have wiped out beekeeping in this country. It didn't because there are populations of bees in the country that are separated from this madness and I believe that the bulk of our um, genetic resistance came from those areas that had a longer time to be able to adapt whereas um, millions of hives have died in the past 20 or 30 years and uh, especially with CCD coming to be more common in the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. Millions of hives, yes. So um, the premise is what not treating is we have a lot of hives, so some die, they die, and then maybe split so there's less, there's um, times when there's no room for the mites to spread, is that your premise? Not exactly, and I'm, I'm sorry for not making that clear earlier. I should have. Um, my premise is that by increasing the number of hives, we allow for a greater number of chances for success. By every generation that we have of, of one queen having a daughter or multiple daughters, those having multiple daughters, and then they all get the opportunity to survive on their own or not. That gives us more chances to find one of those daughters that will have the random variation of genetics that allows us to adapt. And that's one of the great benefits of, of the way beekeeping genetics works is because it has an incredible ability for adaptation. And we need to take advantage of that. And what, what my method does is by increasing efficiently the number of generations that happen and the number of daughters in each one of those generations, we can cause adaptation to occur more quickly. So this method, I would say, is not a long-term thing. It's to help a new beekeeper develop those genetics so that two or three or four years down the line their loss rate goes from 80% down to 20%. And when we get down to 20%, like I've had um, this last year I lost like 15%. I've had years in the past where I've lost 4% and 11%. There's always going to be a loss every year. That's another thing we must understand is that there's never, the loss is never, we should never expect the loss to be zero. That process by which we're losing the hives that can't cut it should be something that we should embrace. And so what this does is kind of two-prong and that's one to, to take that natural selection and make it supernatural selection. I don't mean supernatural and like Superman. I mean like super extra natural, let's just say. And the other one is to give us more chances so that, especially with new beekeepers, when, when they start out so often, they'll buy like one package and it'll die and then they'll give up. And I don't want to see that. I want to see beekeepers 
who go year after year after year and keep growing and learning and expanding their understanding and instead of causing a negative outcome for the for the species because because treating when we don't treat we select for strong bees and weak diseases because if that disease is strong and it kills the hive then it also dies right but if the disease is weak then it can exist without killing the hive and we have a, a normal predator prey relationship when we treat we select for weak bees because they they don't need to deal with their problems and we select for strong diseases because when we treat for a disease now it to overcome what we're doing it has to become stronger so that's how we get um, bacterial infections like uh, you'll hear one called MRSA methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus that's a disease that adapted to a medicine called methicillin and so now it can't be killed right that was a disease that was selected by that by that medicine this kind of requires a person to have quite a few eyes and expanding all the time for it to be it seems like that I really recommend about five you can it doesn't mean like you have to expand from five to fifty every year you could expand from five to ten or you could expand from two to six or you know from some small number to some slightly larger number expecting that you can cull out the weak performers or you can um, you can weather losses better yes so I'm trying to do is you're talking about bees adapting which in my mind means they develop, they develop a behavior pattern and then you talk about genetic alteration which in most species is terminal genetic changes <coughs> most cases kill the species and kill the animal so what are you talking about exactly? I'm not talking about um, I'm specifically not talking about um, mutations, right? Like if, you know, a five-legged sheep does not run faster than a four-legged sheep. It just gets eaten by a wolf. What I'm talking about is, so what, we've, what, what has gotten the biggest press is hygienic behavior, where the bees... It, they don't, it, the hygienic behavior hasn't been created from nothing. It's been taken from this low level and been selected for a higher level. Now there's a certain too high level where bees with too high a hygienic behavior trait will chew out their own brood and kill their own brood and then they'll just die. Right, so there's always a balance from one area to another. And that's the reason why I don't go for bees that are selected artificially for hygienic behavior because specifically like um, chewing out mites is not the only way that a hive can deal with mites. Um, my hives that I've been able to observe tend to still have plenty of mites. They're just in the drone brood they're not in the worker brood. Okay, that brings up the next question. If you're going to try and develop a strain of bees or select bees, you haven't really talked about the drones. It's not just going to be raised in the queen's time. That queen has to go out and breed. And then it seems to me the real control point is the drones. If you don't flood the area with drones with that behavior characteristic, for that genetics to, to manifest, it, manifest that behavior characteristic, what's the point? That's a good question. And um, there is a certain capacity of the drones to affect that. And I have kind of neglected that capacity because, um, especially with small beekeepers, there's no way that most beekeepers who keep less than 20 or 10 hives are going to be able to influence the drone population in that grade of 
um, capacity. And even if they were, you'd be starting to worry about um, about inbreeding. So we don't we don't want to do that. So my method focuses on increasing more on the queen side and perhaps taking a few more losses. And I also think that um, the drone aspect of it doesn't quite account for as much effect as people think it does. Um, how, how can it not? It's, it's a Unfertilization, so it's 100% of the genetics of the queen that is Right. And if you read it, honey bee genetics that go on their line and, and, and read, they, they are the carriers of the recessive trait, which hygienics is the recessive trait. And that's why, like I said, I'm not fully reliant on the hygienic portion of it. I'm reliant on whatever works. You see what I'm saying? So hygienics is, a, is an important part of the overall picture, but it's not the only part. It's been the part that's been most focused on because it is a recessive trait and it's something we can breed for. But there's a bunch of other traits that involve things that we may not totally understand yet, like um, why mites go for, um, and there have been studies done on this, inconclusive in my view, why mites go for drones rather than workers preferentially so if we can develop bees that enhance that selection then that's great because we can sacrifice some of those drones i, I, I think that that there's a study done on the internet you can read it and it's bias go for drones because they have to at the same time it takes them to be fully mature whereas in the veterinarian uh, uh, working food, only 30% of the mites actually become sexually mature. Right, so there's a natural selection there toward drones, but how does the mite find the drone rather than the worker? It prefers the longer brood. Oh, oh they, they did studies with the uh, sick. Yeah, it's. Yeah, the, that's what I'm. The I believe the best evidence shows toward a pheromone yeah, they difference. They did a really good study in Louisiana. And they put pheromone in one beaker dish and a pheromone in a, uh, from a worker in another, and they all kind of congregated toward that. Right. So if we can have bees that enhance that pheromone in drones and cause the mites to go for the drones, and then the drones you know, it's sac basically sacrifice the drones, then that is a mite control method that doesn't involve the hygienic trait. Which is why I'm looking at a, at a holistic look at it rather than just the hygienic part. Um, I've had great success this last winter with a technique I started last fall. And this is not a original technique. I mentioned it uh, a couple months ago, the last meeting. And uh, in May 2011, the um, American Bee Journal has a letter to the editor. The letter to the editor is by um, a previous contributor to the American Bee Journal, someone who had written a previous article. And it's in response to another bee expert that had written an article just prior to May, May 2011. So this was probably the article that he referred to probably would have been in, in like uh, February or March or somewhere in there. Someone wrote an article, anyway, some BS expert wrote an article that uh, said that the, that the free bottom board didn't seem to have a whole lot of, in, in, his, in the expert's opinion, the free bottom board didn't seem to have a whole lot of effect on Varroa um, uh, abatement. And, uh, so the response uh, the, in the letter to the editor uh, was, yeah, it doesn't have a, an effect at all because the screen is too, is too small and bees cannot fall through the screen. And he says, if you set up a hive with half inch hardware cloth, a bottomless hive, all my hives are bottomless now. I wouldn't go back to bottomless. Um, and uh, 
you would set up a box, just take an old box, and uh, stake a half inch hardware cross on it. Big holes. Then you stamp your boot box or whatever right on top of that and just stack them up after that. The, the, the half inch allows bees to fall through. So if there's a dead bee, um, you know, if they pull a bee out of the hive or something like that that's got a mite on it, um, if there's a dead bee, if you have a bottom board or a screen bottom board, it's just going to go down there. Some nurse bees got to have to clean out that bottom board. The mice going to go get a ride back up to the root nest because it's a reinfection situation. So it's a situation uh, with a bottom situation. It's like you're in a hollow tree, and the entrance is, is somewhere up at the top of the hollow tree, but all the dead bees just drop down, you know, six feet down to the bottom. The bees never go down there. And, the, and so I tried this last fall. Uh, results this spring, fabulous. Just wall to wall, you know, perfect brood, no shoddiness. A friend of mine down in the southern number of Celeste, and we set up one of her colonies that way last fall. And we went through all these colonies so, a couple months ago. And uh, um, same thing, with the kind that had the bottom is this fabulous looking brood. All the other colonies, you know, shoddy. And with the exact same thing else. And uh, May 2011, if you read that article, um, it's, it's a way to get rid of Varroa. The other thing is that you never ever see a fish situation, you never see the bees putting a dead body away. It completely eliminates that work. That work is only because we use the bottom board and they've got to clear that bottom board out, otherwise the bees get it up against the entrance and stuff like that. And clog the entrance. It, so you've been making a lot of this to work for funeral service. But you can bond it. It's just, you know, it, it's, it's just so simple. Uh, um, the, you know, the, the phobia, when I thought about this, I read that article years ago. I kept thinking about it, and it made perfect sense. But I'm thinking to myself, ocean on the bottom? I mean, how are they going to control the heat? I mean, how are they going to, you know? They don't have any problem at all. They love it. Is so is, is that bottom box with the screen on top, yeah. is that sitting on the ground? No, no. I've, I've, the, what I found out is, uh, I, I, I've done a number of these now, and so what I do is I set the edges of the boxes on cinder blocks. And I started off with one cinder block, that was too low. The bees, when they fall down, oh God, you know, so they, they, they're in their box, they come through the half inch hardware cloth, if they're one cinder block high, they hit the ground. I don't want them to hit the ground because there might be dead bees and mites down there. So I put them on two cinder blocks and they learn to, you know, they, they curve, they fall down and, and catch themselves and go back up. But when they come in, they, 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 they hug them. Three cinder blocks, four cinder blocks, I tried all those. Um, that's, you know, unnecessary heights. Two cinder blocks, 16 inches above the ground. Um, if, you're, if your first box, you know, there's nothing on the bottom of the box, there's oil on the top of the box, then you start to crash. Is there another entrance or they just no. come through the bottom? Okay. No, and there's no entrance on top at all. The heat is retained only because you, you in the colony, the heat is retained because you don't have a top entrance at all. There's no vent on top. You know, it's sealed up there. The heat rises. Um, if you've got a comb to build, uh, it's nice and warm up there. You know, it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't What's that? What about Ralphie? They don't seem to have a problem that way at all. That's another thing I thought about and was good about for years, reading that article, but I decided to try it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know. Because here we are trying to like, bring the entrance down to two bees, and then there's all that space. I'm sure, if you, had, I'm sure if you had a yellow jacket, you know, infestation like a couple of years ago, uh, uh, I never had seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. That might be a problem. Mm -hmm. But a skunk or something like that, you know, we, there's a hardware class there. Um, plus, the, the larva bees can't see the entrance. Yeah. You know, uh, if you got an entrance, and they can they can see the entrance. They can see where the guard be there. They can zoom in. And they can't see it. They got to go down and then up. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to defend. It's very hard to attack when you're going up. Yeah. You know, if you're on the top of the hill and uh, you're defending, that's a good position to be in. <laughs> yeah. 2011 May American Bee Journal. It's a letter to the editor. I have just begun in the last couple of months started hearing about bottomless hives and I'm interested. I think that may be the next um, kind of big thing. So 
You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Even though it's already been around. A bottom board for a hive is a great thing to move the hive. As soon as you get it moved where you want to, get rid of that thing and you know, save it for next move. That's that. I got them, I don't use them. Awesome. That's, that's great. Uh, let me just wrap it up here. Um, I'm sure you've all read this while I was talking. Um, take advantage of your friends, this group of people here. I mean, the way that um, the way that you guys are running the group is awesome, and having having everybody show up half an hour early to ask questions that is outstanding. So many groups exist where um, new beekeepers are not nurtured and listened to and they're just kind of preached at and so I really want to congratulate you guys on the way that you're doing your thing here um, take advantage of this take advantage of your friends and neighbors um, rather than popping out your credit card and trying to order a queen when one of your hives goes queenless if you've got extra hives or your your friend or neighbor has hives just take one frame of brood out of that hive and put it in the queenless hive once a week until the problem goes away. Instead of kind of be countercultural, instead of um, buying buying your solution or taking a pill to solve the problem, um, rely on your friends and neighbors because these things can be solved without external inputs. Do we have any more questions before we're done? If you go ahead, just, and it might be too long, but I but um, I don't yet understand the timing of the nuke making when you're taking when you when say you're just starting you you, you took your frames and you took one two three and then the next week did another. But you've already made the decision about how you want to clean them, right? You're not just letting those 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 nukes sit there without queens, and then doing the either the swarm cell or the you know the, the one of those three methods. It's a, it's a question. So you don't make those splits, make those nukes, and let them sit, and then you do your queen thing. You already have something happening before you make those nukes. No, I'm sorry, I didn't make that more clear earlier. In that specific method where we're taking one frame out of multiple nukes and making a new nuke, yeah. we're just letting that nuke make its own queen. Okay. And that's how I kind of segued into the part where this is really wasteful because most of the queens die. So it, it does work. It's just kind of wasteful. So it's basically, instead of taking one hive and doing a walk away split and making two, you're taking five hives and only taking a little bit out of each one and making another one. But because you can make a, take a little bit out of each one, you can do that repeatedly rather than with a normal walk away split. You really only can do that once or twice a year. Does that answer your question? I'm going to work on it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I okay. want to make them, but I'm not quite there yet. <coughs> That's okay. Keep, yeah. keep studying, ask questions. Um, the information is out there, and I want, to, uh, I want to just impress upon everybody how free all this information is. Um, all these things you see up here are free, plus maybe ad banners once in a while. Um, check out our Facebook group we've got over 8,500 members now that's how I got um, got connected with Jamie um, the forum it's quite a bit less popular but we're trying to build that up um, take opportunity to listen to my podcast which is also free and you can I've had uh, I've had 34 episodes so far I've had lots of different um, big name beekeepers on there and I'm going to be getting more in the future and they cover all sorts of topics all sorts of wonderful things and you can the great thing about podcasts I love is I can be doing just about anything else 
and listen to podcasts. Um, then my website is kind of like a small encyclopedia, very small encyclopedia of how to keep bees. Another good website, probably many of you have heard, is um, Michael Bush's website, uh, bushfarms.com. He's got, his is much more, the, his encyclopedias are thicker. So, and then uh, one thing I didn't put up here, or did I? My, my YouTube page, I've got about 30 videos of different presentations from um, both famous beekeepers and non-famous beekeepers and even non-beekeepers. So there's lots of different information, very broad coverage there. Any other questions? Yes. Do you feed your bees? Not usually. I have this last year because I, uh, I moved from Denver and I severely reduced my number of colonies so that I can't afford as much right now to have one of them die of starvation. So um, I recommend only feeding granulated sugar because it only works in the winter time when it's necessary. They only take as much as they want. There's no robbing problems. Um, but otherwise, I don't feed nukes. I don't feed swarms. <coughs> Um, I don't, uh, when I did packages back in, when I got my first packages back in 2003, I didn't feed them much beyond the initial sugar syrup that they got. Say again? That's probably why you couldn't split it. Probably why. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but my, my philosophy is they're bees, not rabbits. They're supposed to go out and get their own food. They're not in a cage. So I don't generally. And when you get more hives, you can afford to not have to worry about that. Anybody else? Thank you. And I'm sorry this wasn't a bit more well organized. Again, this is the first time I've given this presentation and it's always been text before and I'm much better with text. So I thank you for allowing me to stumble and mumble and, and all the other stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.